Hi guys, it's Claire. Welcome back and welcome to a slightly different kind of video today. A couple weeks ago I got a text from a friend who shall remain nameless saying that they had drunkenly ordered me a gift that I should keep my eye out for and you know I feel like when someone orders you something when they're drunk really anything might turn up. And so I was especially touched and surprised when this thoughtful little tin of personalized book plates showed up in the mail. I do have to admit that my first thought when I opened this was, oh, lip balm. But no, these are Ex Libris from the Library of stickers that I can put in my books, and they have a bear with a book and a cup of tea on them, which is very on brand for me. There are 20 book plates here, and today I thought I would pick out the books from my library that I want to stamp them with. The catch being that these are my 20 favorite physical books in my library, which is not necessarily the same thing as my 20 favorite books books in a non-material sense. Here, for example, is a stack of some of my favorite books that physically don't mean that much to me because in most cases I originally read these books in another format and then got a hard copy after the fact. In contrast, the 20 books that I will be talking about here today are physical objects that I hold very near and dear to my heart and that I imagine will be in my personal library hopefully for many years to come. And so a few factors went into how I chose these 20 books. First, it had to be a book that I really love in a non-material sense. Secondly, most of the books that I have here are volumes that I have marked up and annotated. As someone who has been a big time journaler and archivist of my own life on and off throughout the years, I do find that having an annotated copy of a book and a record of what struck you and moved you about it is almost like its own kind of journal or at the very least retains traces of your past self in the margins. So in that vein, almost all of these books are the physical volumes that I held in my hands when I first read them. There are a couple of exceptions to that rule that I'll explain when I get to them. And I should also say that this list does favor books that I read less recently and have had on my shelves longer. I guess because they've already stood the test of time in some sense. And you know, consumerism and materialism on booktube are obviously perennial topics of conversation in this corner of the internet. And while I don't normally consider myself to be overly attached to my books, in making this video I did realize that there are some books on my shelves that are particularly well loved and heavily annotated that I would be pretty gutted to like lose in a fire or something. And so I would be curious to know if you have books on your shelves or in your possession that you feel similarly about, or if you're more of a minimalist whose only real attachment to books is to the stories and wisdoms within their pages. Let me know, and without further ado, let's get into my favorite physical books in my library. First up is the book that I probably treasure the most, and that is Villette by Charlotte Bronte, which I read almost exactly six years ago this spring over spring break my senior year of college and at the time I think that I really heavily identified with our narrator Lucy Snow particularly when it came to her like wallflower judginess and her intense bouts of unrequited love paired paradoxically with her I don't need anyone leave me alone attitude. And because of that, this is probably my most heavily annotated and also my most emphatically annotated book. I can really see the emotion and effect that these passages were having on my younger self whenever I revisit it. These are just a couple of my favorite passages if you want to take a gander. 22 year old Claire was clearly reeling. So congratulations Lucy Snow, my emo queen. You are now officially a member of Claire's library. My second most treasured book in my library is probably Pavan for a Dead Princess by Park Min Gyu, even though interestingly this book is not annotated anymore. When I read it a couple of years ago I annotated it with a pencil and then when a friend of mine wanted to borrow it I guess I felt like self-conscious or something and erased all of my annotations, not before typing up all of my favorite passages into a Word document, fear not. But yeah this book is about three 20 year olds living in Seoul in the 1980s and it is just 
the most emotionally tender thing I've ever read. It's a book about the pain and beauty of being young and it's a book that just grows more and more dear to me the more time that passes. Although I do worry that rereading it further down the line at some point will be less resonant the older I get and the farther away from 20 that I get. Then I have Half a Lifelong Romance by Eileen Chang, which is another book that contains some of my most expressive annotations. I think this novel has well over a dozen broken hearts scattered in the margins, particularly towards the end of the book, and I just remember what a gutting reading experience this was. This is such a beautiful but brutally sad book and I am glad to have a record of my past self going through it as they say while reading it. And next up I have Middlemarch by George Eliot. What a book! So funny, so humane, such a balm for the ordinary existentially troubled soul. I won't spoil it but the last line of this book is just perfection. And although I honestly don't love this cover or particular edition of Middlemarch, I do feel like when you spend so much time with a book of this size, you can't help but form an attachment to it. Then I have Pilgrim at Tinker Creek by Annie Dillard, which I read over the course of a summer when I was living in Wisconsin a few years ago. And I remember thinking about this book a lot when I was biking through the kind of wetlands and marshes of Wisconsin in the long summer evenings, and so I can't divorce my feeling for this book from the memory of that time and place in my life. But even beyond that, I just love the reverence that Annie Dillard has for the beauty and horror of the natural world, and how she considers all of it from both scientific and from more religious or spiritual vantage points. I'm not a particularly spiritual or religious person myself, but I often think of this passage in particular that reads, Cruelty is a mystery and the waste of pain, but if we describe a world to compass these things, a world that is a long brute game, then we bump against another mystery, the inrush of power and light. Unless all ages and races of men have been deluded by the same mass hypnotist who there seems to be such a thing as beauty, a grace wholly gratuitous. Next up is an interesting one, and that is We Were Eight Years in Power by ta Coates. This is a collection of essays written throughout the eight years of the Obama administration, and while I wouldn't say that this is one of my favorite books of all time, I do remember reading it in late 2017, very much mired in the despair of the early Trump era, and I remember how even at that time, the essays in this book felt like they belonged in a time capsule. I remember in particular reading the final essay in this collection, which is a piece called My President Was Black, and how in that one essay Coates is able to evoke the false promise and illusory magic of the Obama years, and then just raises it with the reality of what followed. So yeah, this book to me just feels like an artifact of an already extremely fraught moment in American history, and so it's one that I want to hold on to as kind of a document of the times. Next up I have Alice Munro's Selected Stories 1968 to 1994, and like Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, this is a book that I read pre-booktube. I read it over the course of many months. It's clearly an extremely well-loved volume, and the first story in this collection, Walker Brothers Cowboy, is actually one of my favorite short stories of all time. It's about a young girl kind of realizing that her father is a person with a past and a life that she can't even begin to fathom. And it has this beautiful passage at the end of it that reads, I feel my father's life flowing back from our car in the last of the afternoon, darkening and turning strange, like a landscape that has an enchantment on it, making it kindly, ordinary, and familiar while you are looking at it, but changing it once your back is turned into something you will never know with all kinds of weathers and distances you cannot imagine. Then I have My Antonia by Willa Cather, which is another pre-booktube book that I cherish for its quiet longing and its 
beautiful, exquisite descriptions of the Nebraska prairie. After that, I have a sentimental favorite, which is The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. This was probably my favorite book when I was in high school. I was a big Fitzgerald stan, mostly on the basis of one book, but I did reread this a few years ago and it really holds up. The writing is just exquisite and the kind of romantic readiness of it all coupled with Nick Carraway's subsequent disgust with everything is just fantastic. Next up I have Barracoon, The Story of the Last Black Cargo by Zora Neale Hurston. There's just something about the way that she writes and the way that she's able to capture voice and kind of pull out the thread of a particular story. And this book in particular is just an incredible blend of storytelling and oral history and anthropology that is at once fascinating and illuminating and just emotionally devastating at the same time. Next up I have A True Novel by Minae Mizumura, which is a retelling of Wuthering Heights set in post-war Japan, but in many ways it's so much more than that. It's this deeply nested story that contains frames within frames within frames. And like Middlemarch, this is one of those hefty, chunky books that just fully immerses you in it. And by the time you come out of it, you have this deep attachment to not only the characters and the world that they inhabit, but also the physical book itself. Then I have Milkman by Anna Burns, which is a more recent favorite of mine. And I am curious to see if I feel as emotionally attached to this book in say five years time, but I do imagine that it will still be a favorite by then. And one of the things that I especially love about this particular book is the cover and the way that it nods to this incredible scene in the book in which the narrator describes a sunset that is just this perfect illustration of the social and personal and emotional and imaginative constraints that all of these characters are under while living in Belfast at the height of the Troubles. The next two books I have here are books that I originally read as library books and then bought physical copies of because I love them that much. The first one is The Idiot by Elif Bottomen, which I often describe as a kind of latter-day villette. It's this understated coming-of-age story that captures just how dumb everyone is when they're 19 years old, but it does so with an earnestness and a generosity and this bone dry, self deprecating humor that I just find endlessly endearing. And the second of those two books is The Sorrow of War by Bao Nin, which is a novel of North Vietnam and this surrealist masterpiece. It's incredible. It's just one of those books that kind of sits in your head and your heart and your bones and only becomes more and more haunting and more and more powerful the longer you sit with it. And here's where we come to a bit of a quandary, which is my Joan Didion collection. If I had endless stickers, I would obviously sticker all of my Joan Didion books, but because I don't, I have selected Slouching Towards Bethlehem and The Year of Magical Thinking, which are the first two Joan Didion books I ever read. They're also probably her two most famous. I love both of these. I love the way that collectively they kind of give you this picture of the younger Didion and the older, wiser Didion, and The Year of Magical Thinking in particular is just one of those books that really rewired my brain. And similarly, the last four books that I have here do feel like kind of a cheat, but how could I not include them? They are, of course, the Neapolitan novels by Elena Ferrante. The covers are so heinous yet iconic at the same time. God forbid if they ever repackage these, but you know, it'll be okay because I will have these four books literally forever. So there they are, my 20 favorite physical books in my personal library with the stickers to make it official. Let me know if you have any particularly meaningful physical books in your collection or your thoughts more generally on keeping a library, or if there are any passages from your favorite books that you find yourself turning to most often. Before I head out, I wanted to mention that this video is kindly sponsored by Skillshare, which is an awesome online learning platform for creative and curious people who are looking to learn new skills and develop their passions. From web design and personal development to 
plant care and candle making. Speaking of my penchant for journaling and annotating, I recently took a Skillshare class called Art Journaling for Self-Care, Three Exercises for Reflection and Growth, taught by artist Amanda Rachel Lee. This class included three distinct exercises geared toward a more reflective kind of journaling, and it also had a lot of great info about how to use a variety of mixed media and materials when journaling for further artistic expression. Skillshare classes are designed to fit your busy schedule, it's less than $10 a month when you sign up for an annual membership, and it's curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads and Skillshare is constantly adding new and exciting premium classes for you to explore. So if you're interested in exploring your creativity with Skillshare today, the first 1,000 people who click on the link in the description box below will get a free trial of Skillshare premium membership. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. As always, thanks to you for watching, and I will see you again soon. Bye!